Tonight we continue our series of interviews with candidates for city council in District 4. The district mainly includes parts of Dorchester and Mattapan. We'd like to welcome one of the candidates in the preliminary election on September 8th, Andrea Campbell. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Andrea. Thank you for having me. I want to start with, with your life story because you, know, you, you worked for Governor Patrick uh, as a, a legal staff member. Um, you know, you went to some great schools and yes. you have a twin brother. His life was different. What? How did all this happen? So I was born and raised in Boston, and um, I proudly say I attended all BPS schools, including Boston Latin School. I most recently served as Deputy Legal Counsel for Governor Patrick before embarking on this run for City Council. Uh, before that, I used to represent kids and their parents in education cases, school discipline, special needs cases. I often talk about my twin brother because for me, he is the the reason I pushed past the fear to do this. I prayed a lot about my God-given purpose, my assignment, before jumping into this race. And ultimately, when you challenge someone who's been there for a very long time, sometimes there's a sense of fear. So I pushed past it thinking about Andre and uh, how different our life outcomes turned out. I went off to Princeton University, went off to law school. I feel like the blessings for my life continue to flow. Andre, on the other hand, cycled in another criminal justice system passes away while in the system at the age of 29 as a pretrial detainee. You had some disruption in your family when you were growing up. So I have a sense that aside from innate gifts, you might have had some mentoring, some other relatives, or some community person who came through for you. Absolutely. I had a lot of people that came through for me. And sometimes there were people at the church I grew up going to in Cambridge. Um, my aunt and uncle, who play my parent figures, both my parents are deceased, my biological parents, um, and they have been a part of my life since the beginning. Um, I have, you know, I, we lived in foster care for a period of time, so our biological mother passed away when we were eight months old. She actually died in a car accident going to visit our father, who was in prison at the time. And my father, who was born and raised in Boston, was incarcerated for the first eight years of our life. So during those first eight years, sometimes we lived with foster care parents. And some of those parents are still in my life today. Um, one of the women I call my Aunt Dot, she has been very involved in my life. I've had mentors, I have had college age students take me to different trips out of the city of Boston to expose me to different things. So I've definitely had a lot, um, including God's grace, which I constantly point to as well. When I look over your, your, your platform, I don't see so much uh, trying to take this position into a radically different direction as much as trying to, I guess, build a groundwork, get more in touch with people, do some small things maybe, uh, but open some doors. Uh, why, why was that your first priority? So I, I started the campaign with, I want to say, it was a six-month listening series. I would go around and I would just take notes from anyone who would talk to me. And I started this in December. Um, whether it was people on the individual basis or going to civic association meetings and stuff like that. And one of the biggest things I heard was that we don't necessarily see our counselor enough or we are, it's just not accessible, the person isn't accessible. And so I said, let's start with the job itself and looking to do that job of being a district city counselor excellently. And so the plan that we rolled out today really speaks to way, concrete ways that we can do that by being more accessible, being more accountable, um, and me, my, me as a district city counselor being more accessible. So going to the meetings in person, giving out my cell phone, giving out my personal email, um, showing up and showing up regularly and consistently. And then also looking to engage more people in the civic process in District 4. Um, there are over 70,000 people in District 4 over 40,000 are actually at voting age, close to 30,000 are registered to vote, but they say that I only need a few thousand votes to become the next city councilor, and I said for me to push for more things to come into this district, we have to mobilize more of our community. So it's very much a part of the plan too, is just to get more people involved, especially that 18 to 45 bracket. You're, you're certainly uh, very acquainted with the achievement gap in, in the Boston Public Schools. Uh, what's the most important thing to do about that? I think it starts, um, one, being able to talk and deal with the systemic issues of, you know, you look at District 4, which has some of the worst schools in the city of Boston. District 4 is predominantly a district of color, um, has, you know, tremendous sense of poverty in different parts or pockets of District 4. And when you say it has some of the worst schools, you think this is a problem when you look at the entire city of Boston. And so I think there are systemic issues that we need to talk about at a larger level. Um, where BPS and mayor's office need to address these achievement gaps. 
But I think as a district city councilor, how can we still begin to improve these individual schools in our district um, in a meaningful way? And I think we could be bringing in more resources to these individual schools. We could be convening and mobilizing our school leaders to have more of a collective impact. We could be sharing best practices across different schools. So if one school in particular has really great parent involvement, how can we increase that in another school across the district? So truly being that convener and still moving the needle on things for individual schools in the district, even while we're addressing the larger systemic issues of uh, race and poverty in class. Now there's one maybe unsystemic issue that we've heard mm -hmm. repeatedly about many years from the incumbent is that we need a high school mm -hmm. in Mattapan. What about that? I am not c totally convinced just now that we need a, a Mattapan high school. But I said, assuming that we do, um, there are still uh, unanswered questions related to that proposal. And for me, I am a strategic planner. Um, I like to put together proposals and plans. So I want to know, is the land um, that is proposed for that Mattapan High School still available? I want to know if we cannot get a loan order out of the city of Boston, and it's extremely difficult to get a loan order out of the city of Boston, what, are, what additional revenue um, or sources of revenue are available to build a facility like that? I want to know about the programming. You know, what's going to come out of that school? It's one thing to build a state-of-the-art state structure, but what, how, who are we partnering with to make sure we have great um, programming coming out of that school? I also want to know how do we ensure that Mattapan residents or Mattapan students are actually assigned to go to that school. At least at the high school level we have an assignment process that is citywide. And so if you build a high school in Mattapan it doesn't necessarily mean that students who live in Mattapan get to go. So I think these are some unanswered questions that we need to make a part of that conversation um, in order to actually make a high school in Mattapan happen. Uh, concerns in this district I'm sure both about public safety and uh, the conduct of police. Do you see changing that in any way? I think there's, I think there's a lot of creative ways that we, we could change it. I mean, one thing um, we constantly talk about right here in the district is community policing um, and ways in which we can do a better job at community policing. So I have a lot of residents, whether it's in uh, the Fuller Street area near Codman Square or Bowdoin and Geneva area of the district, who want to know or sort of want to require officers to be trained to interact with residents so that when they're patrolling the streets they actually get off their bikes or get out of their patrol cars and actually engage with residents in a meaningful way in order to really build trust. And I think that's important with any relationship. You want to talk about things other than simply crime, um, to know, you know what's important to the people who live in that community. I know in certain parts of the district they're doing a great job of that. I see officers quite a bit at different community meetings and they regularly attend those meetings. I'd like to see that across the entire district. Um, some people in the district, including clergy, have very meaningful uh, meetings where they have the right stakeholders in the room, whether it's B3, B2, clergy, DCF, uh, or other state agencies. I'd like to see those meetings just have a just be larger um, and not just look at Codman Square, Four Corners area. How can we actually convene these stakeholders um, across the district to have more of a collective impact? Uh, the incumbent uh, is really pushing uh, f for a requirement for, requirement for Boston police to wear body cameras, mm -hmm. uh, at least most of them. Uh, what do you think about that? I would li I'm not opposed to body cameras. I would like to see uh, a thorough, more thorough, detailed cost analysis. Um, I know there's money available at the federal level for procurement of the cameras, but I think there's still a question mark about how much it would actually cost to maintain them, to maintain the data, to maintain the servers. Um, but I'm not opposed to trying a pilot program. I think we did it with dash cams, and so I say, why can't we try it with body cam cameras? I think there are a lot of people in District 4 that I've heard from directly um, that want to see body cameras, so I think at the end of the day we have to represent the voices of the people. One other concern, uh, speaking of what the people are saying these days, a lot of uh, fear of uh, displacement from the cost of housing. Uh, do you think that the council should enact some kind of new uh, tenant protections to at least slow down the displacement force, if not actually stop it? Yes. The short answer is yes. I have been to quite a bit of um, anti-displacement meetings, gentrification meetings, there are some organizations, including like City Life, they're doing really creative things, including in Chinatown CPA, um, to make sure that units or new development is affordable to the people that live here, to make sure that people who currently live here can stay here. 
whether it's looking at making sure that residents are in the room when developers come in and talk about affordability and actually ask, what does that unit cost? Uh, or looking at land trust or looking at for cause evictions so that people aren't evicted from their home um, when someone comes in and buys the property. So I think there's a lot of creative things that we could be doing at a city level, um, citywide. And these organizations are already doing it. So I would love to begin to think about how do we adopt some of their creative ideas and make it um, apply to everyone across District 4, but also the city of Boston as a whole. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Andrea Campbell, candidate for city council in District 4. And the preliminary election, by the way, is September 8th. We'll have more news in just a moment.